Hello everyone and welcome to Objective Health. I am your host Doug and with me in our virtual studio are Erica and Elliot. Hello. And Hi. in the background on the ones and twos, keeping it locked down is Damien. Hello. So today we decided we would change things up a little bit and talk about coronavirus. <laughs> and I make that joke like every week. <laughs> Anyway, we were reading, um, there was a couple of interesting things that came out recently. Um, <clears throat> first off, there was one called, uh, by a journalist named John Waters, who I discovered, I was actually thinking it was John Waters, the filmmaker, um, but I discovered that it's actually not John Waters, the filmmaker. I believe he's uh, an Irish uh, journalist. Um, I might be wrong about the Irish thing, but he's a journalist, not the same John Waters, so not the guy with the thin pencil mustache. Um, he wrote a really interesting article called On Viral Entrancement. And in that article, he's basically um, comparing the lockdown measures and the masks, the social distancing, all that kind of stuff to um, hypnosis. And basically that it is a, all the things that are being, um, the, the, the things that are, we are being put through are essentially a mass hypnosis program in a sense. And similarly, Amazing Polly um, came out with something a couple of months ago, <clears throat> a video that was called, Does, handling, Does the Handling of Coronavirus by Our Government Amount to Torture? And in that one, she kind of goes through all the different ways in which this um, lockdown would meet the, um, what would you say, the requirements, meet the... Um, the points, criteria. Criteria, thank you. The criteria for torture, as um, laid out by Amnesty International. So we took these two and thought that they would both, they're kind of interesting comparisons to like, you know, what's going on here? Is it hypnosis? Is it torture? Is it both? So we thought that it would be kind of an interesting show to kind of talk about these different points. So maybe we can start off by talking about hypnosis. Um, one of the things that he talks about, um, like things that are kind of required for hypnosis, and he was talking about how he was actually speaking to a, a friend of his who is a hypnotist. And <clears throat> she was saying, I believe it was a she, was saying um, that the things that are required for hypnosis are essentially focused attention, including the impairment or reduced or reduction of peripheral awareness and an imaginative state, which increases kind of suggestibility. <clears throat> so I, it's not hard to see how what we're going through right now is exactly that. I mean, we have this kind of focused attention, like all anyone is talking about is the virus, you know, and if you have the TV on, it's basically 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you're getting this focused attention on one thing, um, increased suggestibility. I mean, TV is essentially like the perfect medium for this because it's already hypnotic. It's already this medium that sends messages kind of directly into your brain, bypassing all those critical faculties that you have, because it, it does kind of put you into a trance-like state. Um, and it's also uh, the engagement of emotion as well. The whole thing is, is based on fear, you know, plugging home the fear, fear of the virus, fear of uh, doing something that will make other people susceptible, fear of other people. You know, everybody's a potential uh, virus carrier, so you got to be, you know, super scared of everybody else. And then just the lockdowns themselves, um, which, you know, we're going to get into the, the torture aspect of that. But it's also, it's kind of forcing people into these boxes where all they hear about over and over again is the virus and how dangerous it is. And we don't know what we're going to do. And then they bring in stuff about the second wave. Um constant death statistics which are as we've covered on this show many times before hyperinflated um yeah it's basically like you know fear is used to kind of create this fear state and then every day every hour every minute it's getting reignited re uh redone reinforced in your reinforced yeah. in your brain <laughs> i'm having trouble with words today <laughs> Um, he also talks about the fact that there's, you know, the, the idea of this kind of lizard brain, right? The, uh, the lower part of the brain that's more just the instinctual survival mechanism that we all have. 
um, that is not the kind of higher reasoning capacity, and that a lot of this programming goes directly to that part of the brain, Speci- like particularly when you are triggering those um, survival mechanisms, like the constant fear. Um, it causes something that's called an amygdala hijack, which again is something that we've spoken about on the show before, but it's basically where those survival mechanisms, the emotions kind of take over, and your higher reasoning is is cut off. And he brings up um, Gustave Le Bon's um, book called The Psychology of Crowds, um, talking about how there is a specific psychology of crowds where you're not dealing with the psychology of an individual anymore. Um, people kind of take on this mass sort of macro level psychology and that the what the, he, he's saying they're essentially doing is creating that psychology of crowds without having to have everybody all together in a crowd using digital means, electronic means of getting everybody on that same wavelength all the time so that essentially you are in this crowd state. Your higher reasoning is cut off. You're essentially working from emotion, from survival mechanism. Um, Yeah, and um, a very important element of this is the imaginative state. Mm -hmm. So through continually presenting imagery um, of death, of destruction, which in, it calls people to be fearful for their lives, for the lives of their families. We hear numbers. We see numbers, you know, of, of deaths and new reported cases again and again and again. So they drill this down. And when you have this kind of uh, amygdala hijack going on, it's tapping into those very basic, as you said, Doug, the survival mechanisms, right? Mm-hmm. And when this happens continually, what they are essentially doing is they are taking people from reality towards this imag- imaginative state, as he said. Essentially, people are essentially imagining the worst possible outcomes, thinking of the worst possible things that could happen to them, could, that could happen to their loved ones, their family members, their communities. Um, and ultimately, it's these two things combined which set the stage psychologically for um, the next phases of, of, of hypnotism, essentially, mm. how they can go on to ultimately um, get away with introducing whatever measures that they see fit. And as we've seen so far, they, they have, um, they've gone far and beyond what anyone originally expected they would be able to do. But it seems as though people have accepted more and more controlled measures because they appear to be in this hypnotic state or, or kind of entrancement, as this mm-hmm. author would, would say. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting. He was talking about the, the use of these kind of loaded keywords, you know, that constantly reactivates that state. You know, deadly violet, virus, new normal, um, you know, commands like wash your hands, wear your mask, um, all these kinds of things. Uh, you know, the, the fact that they are just kind of, I mean, there's multiple ways that you could say any of those things, but the fact that it's kind of like these keywords tend to get used over and over again in the media, um, it kind of is very suggestive that this is exactly what's going on, that there is this kind of hypnotic suggestion happening. Um, and it's interesting because once, once a, someone is in that state of hypnotic suggestion, they become, it kind of, it wires it into the belief center, Right. And then you basically become, as he put it, immune to rational argument. It's like, Mm -hmm. and I'm sure that we've all discovered this, right? When you're talking to a friend of yours or a family member or something like that, and you're sitting there and you're trying to reason, right? You're trying to say, okay, look, it just doesn't make sense. There's too much information out there that shows that these masks are ineffective. There's no reason to wear this. It's just a fear response. It doesn't make any sense. And you can't get through, right? There is no, that person is immune to, to rational argument at that point yeah and you mentioned previously about how the television and other forms of media are excellent ways um to kind of introduce this into the collective 
uh, psyche, let's say. And one of the reasons for that is, and it makes a very good point, about how the majority of TV shows that people watch are soap operas, are reality TV, um, are, are, are basically fictional, right? Mm. And the way to um, hold the audience's attention is by making these fictional pieces uh, loaded with emotional hooks, right? Mm -hmm. People become absorbed and they are engaging in that imaginative kind of part of their, um, their psychology, right? So, mm -hmm. so they are in a state of heightened imagination. They are in a state of emotional engagement with the characters, with the plot line. Mm -hmm. And so you have news uh, you know, 15 minute news, which is wedged in between these highly emotional, uh, emotionally and imaginatively engaging programs before and after. So essentially his point is that as people are watching these things, they're being absorbed into the plot line or whatever's going on on the TV show. And then all of a sudden they're, they're, they're exposed to this 15 minutes or half an hour of news. It's going to put them in a much more susceptible psychologically susceptible state to then take upon um, or absorb the information and do it without question. And it also means that they are going to be more susceptible to reacting emotionally, mm -hmm. to reacting imaginatively to the, um, to the scare tactics essentially. And that's one of, you know, that that's, that's really important that they do that. They need to have people emotionally invested in the, narrative if that wasn't to happen then people would i would imagine people would not um follow or toe the line as they have done mm -hmm. and so if you can get them engaged emotionally get it to scare them to tap into that fear center or to tap into that lower part of the brain then ultimately they are going to be um in a state of of hypnotic uh, is it suggestibility? If that's a word, mm -hmm. they're going to be much more suggestive. Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately. Yeah. I like how he wrote the reptilian non-brain response to repetition. So I think it's important to note, even for people that don't watch TV or aren't TV watchers, that they use words and phrases, memes, cliches, and it serves to embed the hypnotic suggestions to the extent that they become beliefs and thus you're immune to rational argumentation. But these physical triggers can be more efficient than verbal ones, especially if self-administered creating an instant Pavlovian effect. So for people like us, like I haven't had a TV in 25 years, I don't really watch TV. But I could see, especially doing research for this show, anywhere you go out in public, it's those words, those phrases, those cliches, the pictures. If you're not constantly trying to discern what's happening in your environment, you could very easily be kind of swept up in that wave, that crowd. And um, it's, I'm finding it's mentally exhausting. It, it can, you know what I mean? Like you can't go, and I live in a country town in the middle of nowhere, and it's still, um, every interaction at the gas station, all of it, it's just reinforces, reinforces, reinforces. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, I was kind of of the belief system with the mask thing that, oh, you know, maybe it'd be like 30 days and we'd get beyond this. We'd realize that we're not bioweapons, healthy people don't spread disease, all very commonsensical kind of stuff. And it, boy, did I have a shock that it's just, we're just like doubling down now, mm -hmm. you know, like double down, even though all the stuff is coming out about the mass, not really preventing it. It's like people now are so locked into that belief that um, it becomes an us versus them mentality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's it's very much like the crowd mindset or the crowd mentality, um, as Labone described all those years ago. Um, here's just one of the quotes from from this piece. Um, and it says, "In a psychological crowd, individual personality disappears. Brain activity is replaced reflex activity. 
and a lower lowering of intelligence. So we know just from the basic kind of brain physiology that when that reptilian lower part of the, the brain, you might say, is perpetually activated in a similar way to the amygdala hijack, as Martha Stout described, um, essentially that is shutting off the prefrontal cortex. It's actually reducing the activity of the part of the brain which is responsible for um, cognition, for thinking critically, for being able to weigh out the pros and cons of something or weigh out whether something is more likely to be true or more likely to be false. Mm-hmm. And so actually by tapping in, by really uh, milking it, let's say, <laughs> milking it and just getting people in this heightened state all of the time, then it's an excellent way to actually shut down people's ability to critically analyze information mm-hmm. and again, heightened, uh, heightens their suggestibility. So um, it seems to have worked out very well the way that it's been played. And I think that actually the, the, <laughs> the, the people who are, um, who, who are devising the media strategies here, they, they, I mean, they're truly genius. You've got to give it to them. Uh, it was worked out. Yeah, indeed. Evil genius. Um, but I think that the, these kind of psychological tactics, they were well studied. They've been well studied in the past and they have been made use of. And we can see that more and more by the day. Mm-hmm. One other thing, I mean, I know we're going to move on to, to torture in a second here, but there was one thing that I wanted to mention that, um, Waters actually brings up, and that is the importance of rituals in um, in hypnosis um, or the hip- hypnotic factor of rituals. And he says that ritual is a key factor in the alteration of expectations, which in turn transforms reality. Rituals are proce- uh, pro- sorry, rituals are a process of initiation and renewal, which reinforce beliefs, behaviors, and values, inducing conformity, groupthink, accommodation to changes in structures, a reinvented sense of belonging. They are transformative, redivining, rebirthing. In the course of the pandemic, the mask has emerged as a new symbol of pseudo-solidarity, though really it is an instrument of fear-mongering and alienating. The more threadbare the COVID-19 story became, the more people seemed to be wearing them, not so much as a precautionary apparel as a form of accusation. You are threatening my life. The rituals anchor the subject in this situation. The mask provokes a death of the ego, enabling a new self to be born, the temporary covering of the old face, while the new one is immersed in the period of gestation necessitated by the transformation. Once the mask is donned, the subject becomes his more fearful self. Washing of hands has a similar effect, but also gives a renewed sense of security. In both cases, the mood of the subject is changed by the action, going outdoors a while and returning with a sense of relief to the decontaminating ritual of hand washing, dividing his reality in psychological as well as physical terms. And I just thought that that was actually very apt. You know, it actually, it is a ritual. It absolutely is a ritual. And, you know, I've often talked about the masks as being like a, a virtuous signaling because we, we know we've done a show on masks and we talked about it multiple times. The masks don't actually do anything, right? And I think that a lot of people are aware of that fact. But it's the new normal. It's the part, it's, it's the ritualistic aspect of, it's like donning like cult robes or something like that, right? Like this is your, this is your new uniform. I am part of this group. I believe in this, etc. You know, so, and the ritual of hand washing, same kind of thing. It's kind of like, you know, if somebody actually did pick up the virus, is washing their hands going to do anything? I mean, by the time you get home, it's probably already traveled to your mouth, eyes, nose, whatever the case may be. It probably, for all intents and purposes, is an empty act, but it's this ritualistic aspect of it. It's like, no, we do this now. The social distancing could even be said to be the same thing. It's it's a ritualistic thing. No, we don't stand within, you know, it's almost like a religious kind of... um, uh, rule, you know, for lack of a better term, you know, they, that, uh, you know, one religion has dietary restrictions, another one, you know, men and women don't touch each other. Well, we stand our six feet apart, our 1.5 meters, whatever the case is. That's our new religion. So I just thought that that was a, a very interesting component of what he was talking about. 
Yeah. yeah, he said it was like the acupuncture of the mind. That was one of the uh, word phrases that he used. And it's so true because, again, as we are more enmeshed in it and it's not going away, it's it's like you said, Doug, just becomes habit. Oh, well, you know, I can't get out of my car unless I have this, that and the other thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you you forget that, oh, there's these social distancing, you get too close to people and they move away from you like they're scared of you, you know what I mean? And because you can't see the lower part of the face anymore, you don't know if people are smiling, you don't, you're, we're trying to read body cues that are now literally masked from us so mm -hmm. it's trying to discern your environment and even sometimes when you're not wearing a mask you get all kinds of looks like you're not going along with the plan you're not right. playing by the rules and if if you have a weak constitution it's very easily uh it's like peer pressure to be sucked into mm -hmm. well i should just comply for this for the sake of not being the the, the lone one out and whatnot and it's a mind, well, I won't use the word, but. <laughs> <laughs> a mind boggle. There you boggle. Go. It's a mind, and we said this, you know, I don't know how many shows ago, it's a mind virus as well. Mm -hmm. I would say more than the risk of uh, COVID-19 is the risk of catching the mind virus. Yeah, absolutely. Have Have we spoken about the the three phases of the hip hypnotism? No, the idealized right. So, in in that piece of writing, um, the author goes through what he says were three main stages in hypno hypnotic suggestion. <clears throat> so, these are referred to as idealization first, devaluation second, and alienation third. And he kind of explains what those terms mean in the context of what we have seen with this COVID drama. So the first stage, idealization, uh, he says that it can also be referred to as love bombing. So this is essentially when the controller or the, you know, the hypnotist, in this case, the mainstream media, the governments, the powers that be, when they try to identify with and mirror the target individual. So essentially what they're doing is they're, they're trying to get them on side, right? Mm -hmm. And they're doing this through flattery, through congratulating um, the general population, po populace for how well they are doing, for how, go how good they are for following, following the rules, how, they are actually, how they're saving lives, through what they're doing and you're actually you're essentially giving everyone a pat on the back you're telling them how how good little sheep they've been mm -hmm. um and what that is 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 essentially doing um is kind of getting them on side right and that's that's the initial stage yeah but it was the second kind of the, stage sorry i was just going to say that phrase that they were using the whole time we're all in this together i think that mm -hmm. that was that was definitely part of that phase you know, the idea that, yeah, we're all in this together. Everybody, you know, we're one of you. Yeah, indeed, indeed. It's almost like sending out the signal that, you know, all is going to be well if we if we follow if we follow these rules, if we continue as we have been doing, then everything will be fine. We're all in this together. We're all saving lives. You know, in the UK, we had save the NHS, yeah. save lives. Don't, what, what was it? Don't leave the house. And now, now it's like wear a mask, save the old people or something like that. And they mm. just come out with something new every couple of weeks. These strange little, you know, phrases and things that are also common these days. But this second stage, and this is where it gets interesting. He says it's analogous to the live cooking of a frog. <laughs> so it's essentially where you have uh, a juxtaposition or a, uh, two conflicting things going on or multiple different conflicting things going on at the same time. So what they will do or what they will say is they will tell everyone how good they are being and how they are saving lives whilst at the same time, they are telling people that actually they need to stay inside 
even more. So, so essentially what they're doing is they're enforcing stricter rules whilst at the same time telling people that they're providing conflicting or contradictory information. So we see this kind of thing in one of the examples given was to, um, it was in reference to the elderly. So it was saying that, um, where are we? Sorry, I've completely lost my <laughs> point where I am. Right. I've, yeah, I've lost the, uh, lost, <laughs> lost the quote, but essentially um, he says here, he says, so images and ideas of restriction, control, humiliation are packaged in sentimental forms of, of manipulation. So we have nurses dancing, um, dancing amidst what we are led to presume are unremitting scenes of death grandchildren waving to their heartbroken grandparents through a wound up car window. The glass becomes a symbol of the invisible wall that may permanently separate them. The new normal thus far merely announced, but yeah, sorry. I, <laughs> okay. I'm not great at reading today. <laughs> Essentially. Yeah. What, what we see is that there's, there's incoherence, right. In some of the messages that provide co contradictory messages. So they might say, Oh, well you can go out. Um, you know, you can go out, out on Friday at 3 PM or 5 PM, but you must not leave the house between 1 PM and 3 PM. Like for instance, I think they were doing that in Italy or they were doing in that in Spain, or they were saying that, only males can go out at one time and females can go out another time. So really in many of the, 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 um, the things that they're enforcing, they don't really make much sense, right? But they are um, enforcing them for the purpose of enforcing them. Yeah. And yeah, basically he says that this incoherent state uh, destabilizes the sensibility of the subject, rendering him amenable to further manipulation since he cannot understand he simply obeys they make almost impossible uh, recommendations that are very difficult to be able to follow and none of them actually make any sense and this is inherently confusing to anyone and so in fact instead of trying to understand it they simply follow it because i think it probably hurts their brain to try to understand it right um and then finally he says that the final phase of the hypnosis is abandonment and what this is essentially equivalent to is the iron fist this is when the powers that be are no longer um let's say they show their true colors so instead of trying to meet people halfway instead of trying to identify or present them um, you know, somewhat similar to the average normal person in society. No, they are establishing their authority. They can start setting um, curfews. They can start really enforcing their powers. They can, um, they will, you know, might enforce more measures which are equivalent to kind of like a police state. Um, and you might see more violence and you might see more sh stricter, more kind of authoritarian measures or totalitarian measures. And at that point, because society is being taken through these stages of hypnotic uh, manipulation, people are generally quite ripe for that kind of control. Mm -hmm. um, and because they have been primed in many ways psychologically, they will be in a, a, a position to, to essentially accept those harsher measures. Yeah. But you can't go from good times to in final stages. You need to prime individuals over a period of time, getting the, to them to a point, essentially degrading them psychologically, which is similar to what we're going to talk about in a minute with psychological torture, essentially degrading them, getting the, to, them to a point where they are essentially, um, yeah, yeah, their, their defenses are lowered. So that was a bit of a long, uh, long winded <laughs> way of, of saying, but there's, there's phases and it seems that actually um, this is what we've been taken through. Yeah. And he compares it to Stockholm syndrome, you know, suddenly you're, it's like a, a way of uh, getting compliance from your captors to the point where they're dependent on you essentially. But yeah. You're even seeing it be, you know, um, used 
obviously because mandates in the U.S. are from different governors, different states. But, you know, you see it like, oh, you all misbehaved. You went to the bar. We got to shut the bars down now, you know, or, uh, you know, oh, you misbehaved. Um, We got to take away this right or that right. But you can still go to Walmart and you can still go to, you know, the big box stores. You can buy on Amazon. So you have choice but it's limited and it's slowly, slowly limit, limiting everything until people will just um, self-regulate out of fear of, you know, again, what Doug said, the Stockholm syndrome, you know, I better behave if I want to get my, uh, you know, choice to go out from one to two in the afternoon. And- well, maybe like, let's move on to the other one, the amazing Polly video which was does does the handling of the coronavirus by our government amount to torture and <clears throat> we if you go over to um sot.net to look at it there um sot.net actually uh, transcribed the whole thing so if you prefer reading to watching or if you want to read along which i sometimes like to do it's um very uh it's a lot easier to do it that way i think but um Anyway, she goes into, in in the video, she talks about the 1975 Amnesty International report on torture. And she says that there are four elements of torture. Um, the first being at least two persons involved and that the victim is under physical control of the torturer. Um, second, infliction of acute pain and suffering, including mental and psychological pain and suffering. Three, intention of torturer is to make the victim submit to break his will and destroy his humanity. Four, the torture is a systematic activity with a rational purpose that could be confession, information, punishment, or as a political weapon to set an example for others. And just, you know, reading off that list, I think you can kind of see how what is being kind of inflicted upon us at the moment, you know, it checks all those boxes, essentially. You know, at least she calls it not non no touch torture. So a lot of times people think of torture like they they see images of Guantanamo Bay or Mm -hmm. physical torture. I think the thought of her using that term and it may have even been in that document that no touch torture. It's it's very well explained. I think she does an amazing job because you think, well, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a thinking human rational person. Like I'm not going to be tortured. And then you start to see that this no touch torture is the way that it's happening. So they define torture as torture is the systematic and deliberate infliction of acute pain in any form by one person on another or a third person in order to accomplish the purpose of the former against the will of the latter. I mean, that's essentially it. When you look at what's going on right now, and you've been kind of keeping, you know, your head straight during this whole thing, and you haven't bought into the uh, the stupid COVID panic, it's, you, you know, then you can't help but look at this as something that's going on deliberately, um, and it isn't about saving lives. It isn't about trying to stop the spread of a virus. There is something more going on here then you can't really help but look at it as something like torture. Like what is being done by, like there, if there is no virus to be afraid of, then forcing people to stay in their homes, forcing people to stay apart from each other, not letting people go to see each other, have any kind of human contact. Um, all of the different things, have to wear a mask when you're out so you can't see anybody's face. All of these things are essentially psychological torture. And, and they sustain it. It's sustained. Like, again, back to what I was saying earlier, you know, you think, uh, oh, it's just 14 days or it's just a month. We all got out of the lock. Now we can slowly start to open back up. And then there's the fear of the second wave. And, mm-hmm. and anytime you start to think that things maybe will go back to some semblance of normalcy, it, it changes again. And all of a sudden it's, you know, more intense. And now we have the... Uh, testing requirements if you even have a fever or a cough and then you know you got a self-quarantine if you travel to a different state i mean it's just it's never ending it's like a black hole of 
potential possibilities. Yeah. Well, Polly goes through um, something called Biderman's chart of coercion. And essentially, this was a guy who um, was around after... Um, uh, I, was it the Vietnamese in the Vietnam War? Um, or the Koreans? No, I think it was after the Koreans, Korean War. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, after the Korean War, they the Americans were kind of like shocked at how effective the Koreans were at getting American POWs to talk. Um, and they thought that they had some kind of magical ability to force these guys to um, confess everything. And Biderman did some research and said, no, you know, it's not magic. They just have very efficient psychological torture techniques for um, extracting this information, the no-touch torture thing. So he went through and he had, um, on his um, chart of coercion, he had like eight points. And maybe we can just go through them and kind of compare how these eight points are being, we can see those reflected in what's going on right now. So the first point is isolation. And, okay, that's like an easy one. That's pretty obvious. Just the lockdown, being forced into yeah, a well, hospital. Yeah, they've come out quarantine. and said it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It is isolation. Isolate. Yeah. <laughs> the nursing homes, quarantines, all these things are instances of isolation. Um, forcing people not to be able to see their families. Sorry, go ahead, Elliot. Yeah, n- no, I was just going to say it's not just physical isolation. Mm. It is very much, you know, psychological, emotional uh, isolation mm-hmm. as well for these people. And there are so many people who feel emotionally isolated from the world. They don't Absolutely. feel like they can, you know, there's one thing just kind of being stuck in your house, but then being told that no one else can come to see you for three months. For instance, the elderly who might only have one or two family members and they haven't actually seen a, a real human being in 12 weeks, mm-hmm. you know, that is, that's pretty severe isolation on every front, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And the second one is monopolization of perception. And we even talked about this with the, uh, the hypnosis as well, you know, the 24 seven news cycle, um, the censorship of any uh, dissenting voices, social shaming of anyone who speaks out um, against the, the the situation. They talk about in the document barren environments, restricted movement, and monotonous food as being <laughs> elements of torture. Well, barren environments, it's like the streets are empty. Restricted movements, yeah, you're not allowed to leave your house. Monotonous food, well, that might be a bit of a stretch, but at least, I mean, there are food shortages going on. People were, especially in the beginning, going to um, supermarkets, and there was very little there for them to get, you know? Yeah, and on on that document, just um, Biderman's actual, it's called Biderman's Chart of Coercion. On the document next to the section where it says monopolization of perception, it says fixes attention upon immediate predicament. Mm-hmm. fosters introspection eliminates stimuli competing with those controlled by captor so like exactly what what you've just said doug they eliminate all dissenting voices mm-hmm. label them as quacks conspiracy theorists and then actually like what we've been talking about throughout this show on the news in the media every every avenue is saturated fixing everyone's attention upon this immediate threat they lose sight of everything else. Mm-hmm. Immediate threat. Yeah. So yeah, completely mon- monopolizing, you know, everyone's perception, right? Yeah. The third point on there is induced debility and exhaustion. Um, Feeling that right about now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, she talks about, you know, semi-starvation and yeah, no, not everybody's feeling that, but there certainly are instances of that going on. There have been food lines forming and, uh, I remember in Italy at the beginning, there was, um, well, not the very beginning, but after it had been going for a while in Italy, there was um, food riots, or at least the the threat of food riots. There was looting for food, not that like the looting going on in the U.S. where people are stealing shoes and clothes and stuff. This was like people who were actually starving. Um, exposure. Polly said in the video, you know, exposure, like if you have to stand in line outside and you're exposed to the elements and stuff. Okay, well, maybe. 
Um, but exploitation of wounds, I think that's a big one. Because especially mm-hmm. if you think of wounds as being psychological wounds as well. Um, I think that uh, certainly they are exploiting people's fear. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, even like exploiting the... Like, I'm thinking through... If you, if you test positive, right... Um, you could kind of look at that as kind of a wound or something like that. Like right from that point on, you are treated like, like cattle, essentially. It's like you, you just because you took this test and it was positive and we all know how many false positives they're coming up with. But if you're test positive, then suddenly you're isolated. You're um, thrown into quarantine. Your family has to be taken away and all these kinds of stuff. That, that is like straight up an exploitation of a wound. Um, Yeah. And prolonged constraint is another component of that as well. Um, and yeah, it's not much of a stretch to think of that one. Uh, the fourth and prolonged, th- prolonged interrogation as well, right? Have right. you washed your hands? Yeah. Are, yeah. You, are you wearing a mask? Have you been in contact with anyone with COVID? Are you sure? If you have, then you you should not be going out the house. You should not be seeing anyone. You should not be doing anything. You know, it's like mm-hmm. when you walk into a shop, there's some places, at least in the UK, who say, you know, um, have you washed your hands? Wash your hands before you come in mm-hmm. or, you know, contact here, tracing. Yeah. Here in the US, they take your temperature every right, time. Right. Yeah. You walk. There you go. Prolonged. That's interrogation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, this contact tracing app. Again, that's that's interrogation. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, the thor- fourth point is threats, and that one is, again, quite obvious. Anytime you look at a newspaper or online at news stuff, it's all threats. A second wave might come. If you don't do this, more people will die. You are putting immunocompromised people at risk with your selfishness. Um, you're going to cause massive suffering if you don't do what we say. Your children will be re- removed. There's threats of the vaccine floating every, over everyone's head. And, you know, for a lot of people, maybe that's not a threat. But certainly for part of the population, the idea that they'll be forced to get a vaccine is, uh, is a threat. Um, threat of going to the hospital, threat of being quarantined, threat of getting sick. Like, these threats are constant, 24 mm-hmm. hours a day. Yeah, there's quite a lot of threats. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you say it like that, indeed. Um and it for the average person it's 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 an inherently stressful thing to consider potentially going against what is is recommended um because of added the, the threat of isolation from your community from your friends from your family and not just physical isolation but this idea of if you speak out if you actually speak your mind for the people who can see through this th- this stuff but keep quiet to themselves. They must be absolutely terrified to speak their mind because if everyone around them has bought into this, into the narrative, then in fact, they would not only be, have the threats of, um, you know, the threats of kind of um, what we've spoken about there, but they, they also have the threat of potentially losing, losing their friends, being shunned by their family members as well. So it's, it's, it's endless, the, the number of potential threats that people are surrounded by now. And loss of um, employment is also a really big one. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're not complying, you lose your job. Sorry, I had myself muted there, I think. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, Sorry, we can I hear you now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the threat of our host not being, <laughs> not able being to heard. <laughs> uh okay so the fifth one on the list is occasional indulgences and this is the idea that you know they play the good cop bad cop kind of thing when torturing it's kind of like you give these occasional indulgences and we see that a lot too you know it's like well not everything has to be shut down okay walmart can stay open liquor stores can stay open you know um even though the mom and pop shops or, or your business is not allowed to open, well, we'll still let you, you know, get out of the house at least to go and go grocery shopping. Um, they give rewards for partial compliance. Um, you can get to travel if you take the vaccine, you know, that sort of thing. And there's also, if everyone follows the strict lockdown measures, 
then the lockdown will end sooner. Mm -hmm. However, the people who break the lockdown, the people who are selfish, it is their fault, right? Yeah. And so I've I've actually seen people who 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 believe that. They believe that one of the reasons why we were forced to lock down for such a long time was because of the selfish acts yeah. of people who were breaking the lockdown and spreading the virus. <laughs> right so so if you follow these rules very strictly and do exactly what we say then you will be allowed out of your houses exactly right and they dangle that carrot in front of everyone's nose for a while and, that's and then beat you with the stick yeah <laughs> and that's essentially collective punishment right mm -hmm. that whole thing which i'm pretty sure is uh in the geneva convention as being um a war crime but anyway, um, so the sixth one is demonstrating omnipotence. Again, this is pretty obvious. Like, the you know, when you see Fauci getting up there and uh, telling everyone the rules and the way things are going and what everything has to do, he is, you know, has this kind of um, presence of omnipotence, or Bill Gates even more so, I think, you know. Um, and they've shut down the entire world economy. That's fairly omnipotent, I would say. Have the corporations oh, yeah. eating out of their hands? Yeah, I'd say there's a a lot of of that going on where the 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 kind of the torturers or the the government, the powers that be, are obviously kind of demonstrating their omnipotence in this situation. It's like we can shut down your business, we could take away your job just like that. We could take you away from your family. We can do any of these things. Well, and, and Joe Biden just said about masks, it's not about rights, it's about responsibility. So if you think you're going to exercise some sort of constitutional right in the United States, like that's irresponsible. You better be responsible for your behavior. I mean, mm -hmm. talk about it. The seventh point on the list is degradation. Uh, and it says it makes cost of resistance appear more damaging to self-esteem than capitulation reduces prisoner mm -hmm. to animal level concerns so there we go that yeah the trigger the reflex trigger the amygdala hijack the exactly. reptilian brain right mm -hmm. get them yeah. thinking about survival food safety warmth yeah. and then That's that it. denial of privacy mm -hmm. enforcement of minute rules yeah the yeah, Polly was talking about actually the degradation component. Also, things like the closure of salons, um, mm -hmm. only allowing people to buy essential items, forcing people to line up, follow arrows, only use uh, one entrance to the supermarket, one entrance to leave. Like just these degrading. Even the masks themselves, the social distancing, that stuff is degrading. Like straight up, you know. You're not allowed to see my face or nobody's allowed to see your face. It is, it is a form of degradation. And also the, the, the kind of the mobbing that goes on when people are, um, uh, anybody who, who dissents posts something on, uh, on Facebook or social media somewhere saying, uh, that they disagree with what's going on. The social, um, shaming, shaming. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. To, uh, force people into compliance i mean that is straight up degradation for sure mm -hmm. even like separating ourselves from our loved ones holding elders hostage in like uh nursing homes that like what they're putting the elderly through right now is straight up degrading like really degrading and children in schools now what they're doing to them that's degrading as well and the last one enforcing trivial demands and that's the same kind of thing like we were just talking about forcing people to follow arrows, stay within the lines, uh, wear your mask, wash your hands. Like all those things are su like really trivial, especially if you have any understanding of the way viruses work. You know, um, demanding that people stay home unless they're protesting racism. Yeah. Yeah. The contradictions, right? Yeah. In, in trivial, right? It's not even like logical demands purely trivial for instance going into a restaurant you must wear a mask when you go into the restaurant however when you sit down you can take your mask off 
Ah, but if you want to go to the toilet, <laughs> the bathroom, <laughs> then you need to put your mask on again. And then when you come back down f- to eat your lunch and drink your wine, you can take your mask off. I mean, how absolutely trivial is that? I mean, but there is hurting. no logical sense. It's hurting people like sheep or cattle. Mm-hmm. It's like making people, you know, putting them through a maze. And yeah. It's- I was saying before I was saying before the show um, about the the recent rules that were enforced. Um, I believe it was two or three days ago in France. And um, essentially where I live, the UK, holidaymakers in France, there, there'd been lots of people since the lockdown had been re- uh kind of lifted in the UK, people had gone off to, to, to their holidays in France. And, um, and they were given very short notice that actually France was, you know, all of a sudden on the danger zone. And so what that means is, is that anyone returning from France from their vacation would have to go into 14 day quarantine, right? So they'd been given, they had to arrive back into the UK on the land of the UK by 4 a.m. on a certain day. And so you had thousands, I think it was, I think it was hundreds of thousands of Brits who were desperately rushing back to try to get the ferry or the boat or the plane or whatever it was back to the UK just in time. And so there were a variety of videos of people who just made it back at 3:58 a.m. Right. They just made it. So they didn't. So now they could go home. They would not have to quarantine. Right. But there were also people who arrived back 15 minutes later and they needed to quarantine for 14 days. Now, there was one case of a guy, a family, right? A family. So a husband and a wife and their child. The husband arrived in the UK at 3 a.m. Right. No problem. He can go to work. His wife arrived in the UK. I think it was at 6 a.m. So about three hours later. Okay. She and the child have to quarantine when they're at home. But get this, right? The guy lives in the same house. He lives in the same house. But because he arrived back into the UK before the designated time, he doesn't have to quarantine. (laughs) Yet they live in the same house. (laughs) How, if that isn't trivial, I mean, what is? That's a bit, it's like a comedy sketch, you know? Yeah, so, seriously. Unbelievable. What can you say? So what do you guys think? Is it torture? Is it hypnosis? It's all hypnosis. of the above, yeah. yeah. I think it is both. I think it is both. It's almost like hypnotizing people to accept torture. Mm-hmm. Seems that way. It seems, I mean, looking over the list, reading through the characteristics of both, it seems that they they both share some similarities, actually, in terms of the mechanisms or the, all the mm-hmm. strategies. Um, and I think that you probably need to use a bit of both to properly achieve what you want to achieve in either of the, the avenues that you choose to go down, whether it's torture or hypnotism. I'm not saying that all hypnotists need to be torturous, <laughs> but what I mean is, is that when you're commit trying to commit or trying to induce mass viral entrancement like uh, the author would say it or collective hypnotism then that is i think that does usually involve some elements of torture mm-hmm. um and it seems that both of them coexist and they're both happening simultaneously and it seems that the um the psychology of, of humans is just gradually being degraded further and further and we we've talked about this kind of degradation um, of mo- moral values, um, of, of psychological health, emotional health, physical health. We've spoken about this for years and years and years. Um, but ultimately, with this coronavirus uh, malarkey, the, uh, these, these things seem to be heightened. They, you know, they've been ramped up 10 times. So it's definitely out in the open to see for sure. Yeah, I like how she wrote at the very end of this article, since they are moving us along and prolonging the stress, they are bringing us all into the chronic stage where the victims of coercion become broken and their compliance will be all but guaranteed. I think that pretty much sums it up. Mm -hmm. So however 
you get people there, whether you hypnotize them, whether you torture them, you offer them economic stimulus, whatever it is, it's, it's compliance is all but guaranteed. Yeah. You guys have anything to add? I think we've come, come up on our time here. I'd say we probably, we probably covered everything. Yeah. So break the trance. Don't let the torture get you down. Turn off the TV. Turn off the TV. <laughs> Resist the torture as much as you can. Yeah. It's kind of depressing when you think about it. But anyway, thanks everybody for joining us on this exciting episode. We will be back with another exciting episode next week. Thanks to my co-host. Thanks to Damien. And be sure to like and subscribe if you uh, feel so inclined. And we will see you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye.